Good morning, and thank you for joining us for another program in our series. I'm your host, historian Edna Friedberg. One of the enduring lessons of Holocaust history is the power of individuals. Amid the perpetrators and their collaborators, and the millions of others who stood by silently, were many ordinary people from all backgrounds who risked their lives to help others. During Women's History Month, we'd like to share the stories of two brave individuals, both young women in their 20s, who ran towards danger. I'm joined this morning by my colleague and friend, Susie Snyder, who is a curator here at the museum. Welcome, Susie, so good to see you. Good to see you too, thank you for having me, Edna. Viewers, please post your questions for Susie in the comments section, and we'll get to as many of them as we can in the course of the live show. Susie, let's begin with a young woman who had a relatively comfortable life before World War II. Who was Hanna Senesch? Hanna was born in Budapest, Hungary in 1921 to an educated Jewish assimilated Hungarian family. We see Hanna here with Hanna here with her brother and father Bela. Hanna's father died when she was six years old in 1927, and it was really a life altering event for the family. In one of her first diary entries as a teenager, she actually talks about visiting her father's grave and being so familiar with death and cemeteries so early in life. Um, Hannah was someone who found solace in writing, not unlike her father, who was also a well-known writer himself. Um, we know a little about, about Hannah from her diaries, letters, oh, excuse me, a lot about Hannah from her diaries, letters, and poems. And as she grew older, she also took piano lessons and was immersed in the art and culture of Budapest. She was really well-educated. Uh, but things began to change for her as they did for Jews across much of Europe, especially in the late 1930s, as Hungary became more hostile and dangerous. How did Hannah's life change? Um, so she began to experience overt anti-Semitism, prejudice, prejudice against Jews at her Protestant high school. When she was elected as an officer in her school literary society, her classmates called for a, a revote and another election. And she felt it was likely because she was Jewish. They didn't want a Jew leading the organization. For someone like Hanna, who had felt fully part of Hungarian society, this rejection felt especially harsh and jarring. And in 1938, Hungary began to enact a series of anti-Jewish laws, similar to the racist laws in Germany. And eventually Hungarian Jews lost many basic civil rights um, in and they were, ex they were excluded from most professions and forbidden to marry non-Jews. And around this time, Hana began to more closely identify with her Jewish identity and started studying Hebrew. And as she felt less and less comfortable in Budapest, she began to dream of immigrating to Palestine, which was under British rule at the time, and today is the state of Israel. That really became her primary goal. And against her mother's wishes, she moved to Palestine, arriving in September 1939, just after World War II broke out. I think it was very difficult for her to leave her mother. Uh, her grandmother had died just before she left, and her brother eventually ended up leaving Budapest and going to France, and then later Palestine. So this was not an easy decision to leave her mother. And it's always complicated when kind of dreams or ideologies run into conflict with, you know, actual real life decisions, relationships, unexpected events. Um, and uh, as you said, Hannah became a fervent believer in Zionism, the idea of a Jewish homeland, which was quite a natural reaction to her actual birthplace becoming uh, less and less hospitable. And she chose to leave Europe along with many other like-minded young people. Once she arrived in British governed Palestine, what did she do? What was her life like? She joined an agricultural school. She cared for animals and she did farming. Um, you can see that in this picture that you're looking at. It was really hard physical work, very different from her life of art and culture in Budapest. She went from living in a sophisticated city to manual labor and very basic living conditions. And all the while, she was watching news of the intensifying war in Europe and growing concern for her family. She grappled with feeling guilty. She was relatively safe while her friends and family in Hungary were, were not as, they were helpless to do anything to help fa her family. She was helpless to do anything to help her family or fellow Jews that she really left behind in Budapest. And after a little more than three years in Palestine in early 1943, she was, in her words, suddenly struck by the idea of going to Hungary. 
She wanted to find a way to help Jews and to get her mother out of Europe. And uh, for context, you had mentioned earlier, Susie, the harsh anti-Jewish laws that Hungary had independently implemented, but I want to make sure that our viewers uh, remember, Hungary was actually an ally of Nazi Germany during this period. And somewhat unexpectedly, this actually functioned as a sort of protection for Jews in Budapest because it uh, postponed the time when they would come under direct German rule. As a result, they were not deported the way Jews in Poland and other occupied places were. Um, and you describe Hannah's wish to, to help, to um, contribute in some way to those she had left behind, and she had an opportunity to do exactly what she envisioned. Tell us about her mission. So in February 1943, Hannah learned that a special unit was being organized to go on a secret mission behind enemy lines to gather intelligence and help rescue Allied pilots, try to help save Jews. And she immediately wanted to do this and volunteered for the British Army. She trained as a paratrooper, which was very rare for women at the time. And Reuven Daphne, her fellow paratrooper, later talked about how um, the British officer in charge of the operation could not contain his surprise the first time he saw Hannah. Hannah, excuse me. Uh, you can see Hannah here in her um, uniform. Um, and it's highly unusual. She really put herself out there. Uh, so in March 1944, she and three men parachuted into Yugoslavia near the Hungarian border. And Hanna was um, crushed, the, the, excuse me, I'm sorry, just days after they landed, they learned that the German army had invaded Hungary and Hanna was really crushed to learn this, that the window for their mission had closed. Reuven Daphne said it was the only time he saw her cry. And they worked with local partisans in Croatian territory for several months until Hanna prepared to cross the border into Hungary. One of her fellow paratroopers was concerned about the viability of this plan, but Hanna was determined. She told him, even if they catch me, at least it will be known to the Jews that somebody tried to get them. Um, so in June of 1944, Hanna crossed the border into a Hungarian village, but was discovered without in hours and was arrested by local police. Susie, I want to pause for one moment. Um, to welcome our viewers who are watching from around the country and around the world. Thank you for joining us from Gastonia, North Carolina, uh, Vail, Colorado, uh, just a few minutes away from me in Bethesda, Maryland, Cary, North Carolina, Albany, New York, and Houston, Texas. And we're also very glad to have international viewers um, watching from Athens, Greece, beautiful city of Sintra, Portugal, Paisley, Scotland, and Northern Ireland. We're glad that you're here. Uh, so Susie, as you said, just after crossing the border, Hannah was arrested. What happened next after she was captured? She was uh, in prison. She was interrogated and tortured by Hungarian authorities. She was found carrying a radio transmitter and her captors wanted her to give up the codes she used to communicate with her network, um, but she didn't. She was transferred to a prison in Budapest where she was held for five months. And in an effort to get her to talk, they even brought her mother in uh, who was not aware that Hannah had even left Palestine and saw that Hannah had been beaten, tortured, was missing teeth. Um, so you can imagine how shocked and awful this must have been for her mother. But Hannah never broke, even after seeing her mother. Uh, her mother was eventually released and tried to find legal assistance for Hannah, but eventually Hannah was prosecuted as a spy and was sentenced to death. And she was given a chance to beg for a pardon, her captors claimed they would have let her off easily. Hannah was probably skeptical. She didn't accept the offer, and instead she did go to her death. The people who knew Hannah, who served with her, were amazed by her determination and courage, no matter the cost. Even in one of her last poems written in prison before her death, she expressed, but death, I feel, is very near. I could have been 23 next July. I gambled on what mattered most. The dice were cast and I lost. Um, she was executed by firing squad at the age of 23 in November of 1944. And although she was buried in Budapest right away, um, she her remains in 1950 were returned to Israel for burial. Her mother, who had survived the Holocaust and ended up immigrating to Palestine, her, to uh, the state of Israel herself, um, made sure that um, she was always remembered and worked tirelessly to keep her story alive.
And Hannah's bravery continues to inspire people to this day. There are schools named after her. She's quoted regularly. One of the most well-known Jewish songs, Eli, Eli, which means my God, um, is her lyrics set to music. And she is a, a true hero, not only in the state of Israel, where she was buried with full military honors. Um, she's at Har Herzl, Mount Herzl, the National Cemetery, but also to Jews uh, around the world. And it's really astonishing to remember how young she was, given her long legacy of heroism and also of pride in her, her Jewishness. Susie, we have a viewer comment from a woman named Andrea who writes, Hannah was so courageous and selfless after reaching safety and then returning to help others. She is a true heroine in every sense of the word. Yes, absolutely. That's really, she was fearless. She must have been fearless. Uh, one thing that is often striking, you're talking about fearless when looking at uh, episodes of resistance, especially during the Holocaust, it is often young people who felt emboldened to take extreme risks, whether it's because they feel immortal themselves or they have fewer dependents. Uh, you know, we could psychoanalyze it all day. But I'd like us to turn to a, another young woman, uh, this time in Western Europe, in the country of the Netherlands, where we could meet a woman named Marion van, van Biernsbergen, uh, pictured here. Um, an individual who became active in the Dutch resistance during World War II. Susie, tell us about Marion, please. Oh, Marion was born in 1920 in Amsterdam, and she grew up with a mix of Jewish and Christian friends. Her parents were not religious, though, like the majority of Dutch people, they were nominally Christians. Um, and after the German invasion of the Netherlands in May 1940, when Marion was 19, things changed quickly. Marion was horrified by what she saw. Soon all the Jews had to register with the government and they were later forced to identify themselves by wearing a yellow Star of David badge. You can see that here on the clothing on the, in the, on the young Jewish girl on the left. Um, and early in the German occupation of the Netherlands, Marion actually got swept up in a police raid. Tell us what happened. Uh, she was just in the wrong place at the wrong time. She was sleeping at a friend's house for the night and the police barged in and arrested this friend and her roommates. It turned out they had been listening to illegal radio broadcasts, transcribing the news and distributing copies of it. The Germans were vigilantly trying to control the public opinion and they really tamped down anger from the, and tamped down anger from the Dutch. So they treated such things as a relatively serious crime. Uh, although Marion was not involved, she was there, so she was picked up. She spent six months in jail and she was feared that she feared she would be deported to a concentration camp. Um, if the treatment she received was supposed, supposed to be a deterrent for her, it had the opposite effect. She left jail with even more rage towards Nazi policy and the people who carried it out. And she was really determined to rebel. So she already had this angry, resentful mindset against the occupiers, but then her decision to join the resistance was cemented by uh, something else, something she witnessed once roundups of Jews in the Netherlands began. Let's hear Marion describe uh, decades later, looking back in her own words, how her feelings changed after witnessing an attack on Jewish children in Amsterdam. On my way to the School of Social Work, I went past this house, which was a group home for uh, Jewish children who had been brought to Amsterdam by various, in various ways and not placed in families. They were in this group home. And the Nazis were, uh, there was a truck outside and the Nazis were loading the children into the truck. They ranged in age from about two to 10 or 12 and they were crying and they were upset and they didn't go fast enough. And the Nazis picked them up by an arm or a leg one little girl they picked up by her pigtails and threw them over the edge of the truck into the truck. And I just sat there. I, I couldn't believe what I was seeing in my own town. And two other women came uh, from the other side and they tried to stop the, the Nazis and the Nazis picked them up and threw them in the truck too. And I just sat there. But that was when I really consciously decided that if there was anything I could do to to stop this. Uh, it, had, it was no longer an academic theoretical question. What are we going to do to save the Jews? It, it became very real and practical. 
Yes, so this moment becomes a real turning point for Marion. The scene that she describes is also telling. She sees two women who try to intercede. Amongst many Dutch, there was a deep resentment to being occupied by the Germans. The occupation lasted more than four years and a willingness to participate in resistance. Yeah, and one of the ironies is that although the Netherlands was one of the countries with the most widespread uh, resistance to the Germans, and networks that helped Jews, it also had one of the highest rates of death for Jews in the country because the occupation was quite brutal. Um, so what did Marion do? How did she be begin to resist? So she agreed to help hide finding, find hiding places for Jewish children. When a social worker she knew was tipped off by the local police that there was going to be a roundup, Marion took home a two-year-old Jewish boy to her parents' house. The boy didn't stay long in part due to a slip by Marion's mother, when the milkman told her he was low on milk, Marion's mother pleaded that she needed it for the little Jewish boy staying with them. Fortunately, the milkman kept a secret um, and the resistance found a new hiding spot for the boy, which this was not unusual because um, the underground sometimes moved children multiple times. Sometimes they moved as um, much as we, we know one child who's moved as many as 30 times. And to be clear, the moves you're talking about there when uh, somehow the the safety or the secrecy of the hiding place was compromised, right? Exactly. So if there was fear that um, something was going to happen, they would just move from place to place, sort of keep oh. one step ahead. Exactly. So, and Marion's involvement though um, really became much more intense, really escalated. Tell us about how she came to shelter an entire Jewish family. She was approached by a close friend who wanted to hide a father and his three children, all ages four or younger. Uh, Freddie Pollock, seen here with two of his children, the baby Erica and her older brother Lex. Uh, Marion agreed to help. Uh, Marion's friend was able to secure his mother-in-law's house in the country as a safe haven. And at first, Marion visited the family on the weekends, bringing them supplies and staples. Then she moved in full time to help care for the children, including Erica, who was just only weeks old when they went into hiding. The children's mother was in hiding separately in a different part of the Netherlands. Marion had never met the Pollock family before she became their rescuer. Marion really grew to love them. I mean, in time, she became a mother figure to the children, especially Erica, who had known no other mother, and the two really bonded. And you can see here's a picture of Marion holding the baby. One thing, oh, um, I'm sorry. That's okay. What, what did you want to say? <laughs> well, I was going to say that um, you can see that in the, these pictures, Marion really um, did, it seemed like she really did adore Erica. Sure. I mean, here, this baby was only weeks old, right? When she came right. into her care and um, just that emotional bonding that happens, whatever the circumstance. Um, but I want to be clear because I think people watching are likely much more familiar with the a different hiding experience in the Netherlands, that of Anne Frank and her family, who stayed physically hidden for years um, in the secret annex in Amsterdam. But that's not what hiding was like for the Pollocks. Were they physically hidden at all times? Um, they weren't. And one thing that is unusual in the pictures that we've been showing is they were taken while the family was in hiding. That is highly unusual. And Freddie and the children were able to be outside at times because they were not living in a city surrounded by people. Um, while it was illegal to shelter Jews, we know that some of the townspeople were aware that a Jewish family was hiding in their village. Um, another unusual aspect of the experience is the intensive planning that went into bringing them into the home. Marion's friend excavated a hiding place under the living room so the entire family could fit into it in a moment's notice. And so much dirt was removed that he feared someone would notice a pile and get suspicious. So he deposited smaller amounts in different places around the town. And while the family moved about in the home, they were always on guard, always. And nearly, because nearly all the vehicles in the village had been confiscated by the Germans, any kind of car sound was a sure sign of danger. And imagine these little children, all four years or younger, trained to hide under the floor at any moment. Um, and you can see a picture of Erica here um, while she was in hiding. Marion later said she was aware they were living on borrowed time. She said she was scared all the time. They just must have been so anxious, so tightly wound because you, you didn't know um, when suddenly a normal day could turn into 
a, a time of crisis. And in fact, that fear was certainly justified. Tell us about one night in particular when Marion was faced with a really wrenching choice. Oh, so one evening, a Dutch police officer who is a local member of the Nazi party came to the house with three Germans. Freddie and the children had already taken cover in their hiding place. There was nothing to see. The Germans and the policemen left. Marion mistakenly let her guard down. The door was unlocked. She realized she had forgotten to give Erica medicine to help her quiet, keep her quiet. And the baby started crying. Um, go ahead. Actually, if I can interrupt you, Susie, we have Marion reflecting back years later on this incident, describing what happened next. So why don't we pause and, and hear from Marion describing. The Dutchman came back by himself from about a half an hour later. And I had taken the children out because I hadn't had time to give the baby her sleeping powder. And she began to cry. And then I couldn't think of anything else to do except to kill him, which is something I'm not proud of. I've always felt that there should be another way, but at the time I couldn't think of anything else to do. There was a moment of great exhilaration. Thank God the kids are safe. But then, of course, I had to deal with the body. So I can't imagine what she was going through when she shot the policeman. She made this decision quickly, and I'm sure it was tremendously hard. And uh, looking back years later in other oral testimony, you know, she said she felt like she had no choice. But what is also stunning is that she mentions actually that when she grabbed the gun, there was this gun hidden in a bookshelf. She wasn't even sure she knew how to fire it. So she was really acting on instinct, um, on what her gut told her to do as a protector in that moment. Um, Susie, as you said, this was a, a little you know, town in the country, someone's weekend house, and neighbors had to have heard the gunshots, gunshots um, in their quiet place. How did the townspeople then come together to help protect Marion and the Pollock family in the aftermath of this um, gruesome night? Well, when you hear the expression about truth being stranger than fiction, this is one of those stories. And Marion had another friend in hiding, a gay Jewish ballet dancer living nearby. And when he heard the shot, he came running. And Marion begged him to go back inside, but he insisted on helping. He went into the village to speak with the, the local baker who agreed to come with his wagon the next morning. Um, and then they recruited the town undertaker who hid the policeman's body in a casket with another person who was about to be buried. And decades later, Marion wondered if the pallbearers noticed how heavy the casket was. It really did take a village. Just what a cover up. Um, it also just shows that the circles of trust, that the more people were that were involved and who um, somehow contributed to it, the more people who were able to expose what happened there because uh, you were at risk. Knowledge was risky. And a viewer named Jack is writing that Marion was a true mensch, using the, the Yiddish word for a good person, um, a person with a good soul. And if only there had been more like her. And I... Uh, but wholeheartedly agree. I mean, she saved the lives of the, these people. Um, we have another comment, Susie, from a viewer named Marcia, who says that she's watching today and that she actually met Marion at a conference in the late 1990s and had the pleasure of hearing Marion's story from her in her own words. Um, and in fact, after the war, Marion developed a close relationship. <clears throat> excuse me, allergy season here. Um, she developed a close relationship, a friendship, with an American scholar of the Holocaust named Deborah Dwork. And Professor Dwork and Marion led a seminar together for about a decade. Um, that may be where Marcia met her. Um, let's hear from Dr. Dwork uh, discussing what she thinks motivated her friend Marion to kill the Dutch collaborator. Marion was determined to hide that family, to save that family, but she never suspected that committing murder would be the price that she would pay for doing so. And my analysis is that she did not kill the Dutch Nazi because she hated him. She didn't even know him enough to hate him. She killed him because she loved those children. There was no way she was going to allow him to take them away. At any moment along the way, she could have said, I've done what I can. 
It's as much as I can do. I cannot do more. And she could have said that at that moment, but she chose not to. And it's often at moments of extreme fear or crisis that a person's true character emerges. And apparently for Marion, she felt this unshakable need to protect in her core. She was otherwise never a violent person, but she committed this violent act um, in order to protect those who she loved and who she had committed to. Um, we have a viewer question, Susie, um, and it's a perfect question for you because you were a curator of a special exhibit at the museum we had about hidden children. Um, Deborah is asking, do we know why the mother was hidden separately from her children? Can you shed, shed some light and context? Sure. Um, in fact, it's it's unusual that um, family members are hidden together. It was better if family members were hidden separately. So um, in, I'm always, I have to say the story always surprises me because I'm surprised the children were not hidden separately from the father as well. But it is very common to break up the family so that the entire family is not A, discovered, or B, you have this amount of people living in hiding clandestinely, needing food, needing water, you know, needing milk. I mean, this is a perfect example of everybody, it was the war. Everybody had very limited supplies. So you really did need other, you were, you were working with other people to try to provide extra food and extra clothing and things like that. So both um, from a practical perspective, it's difficult, but it also was a way to spread out the risk to not have everyone together. Exactly. Got it. Okay. Um, so Marion continued to care for this family and she was with them for more than two years and built a very deep connection with them. So then what happened when the war ends in 1945 and the Netherlands is liberated? So just reminding everyone that this relationship among these five people did not fall into traditional roles. Over more than two years, they truly became a family. It was highly unusual. In that time, Marion and Freddie fell in love. We should remember that he may not have known that his wife was alive or dead. And when the war ended, of course, Marion, like all Dutch people, was happy to see liberation, the occupiers leave. And naturally, she was relieved that Freddie and the children were safe. But she was also about to lose something that had been very important to her. Freddie and his wife reunited, and Marion made a calculated decision that she would later really regret. She stepped out of the children's lives entirely, thinking that it would help heal their family. And she tried to move on without these children who now felt as if they were her own. Um, so you can see pictures of the post-war pictures of the children. Yeah, I'm looking at their faces. Um, just thinking, you know, what they'd been through and all the disruption that they, they had and fear. Um, we have a question, Susie, from um, Bonnie, who's asking, how was the Dutch police officer not missed? Do you have any insights on that? I don't. Marion never really talked about who he was. She didn't know who he was. Um, my guess, there's a war going on. He was a Dutch collaborator. It was a collaborator. It was not unusual for people to be picked up and disappear. Um, so it, it could be that he, he was missed by family, but people also assume that perhaps because of the war, he was he disappeared through um, just the means of war. And the fact that they were able to dispose of the body meant no one knew he was murdered. They just knew he was gone. Correct. Um, so you've just said Marion stepped away from the Pollock children, stepped away from Freddie. Um, that must have been really, really devastating for her. What did she do to try to move on with her life? She really, she needed to keep busy. So she found a job with the United Nations Relief and Rehabilitation Administration in post-war Germany. While working in camps for displaced persons, Marion met an American, Tony Pritchard. He had been a soldier and was among the first troops to arrive at the Buchenwald concentration camp and see the evidence of Nazi crimes firsthand. Uh, they married it at um, Winsheim, displaced persons camp in Germany. Uh, this is their wedding day here in the photograph, and they immigrated to the United States. And so we see that Marion, she not only distinguished herself as a rescuer, as a lifesaver, uh, and she also tried to help survivors of the Holocaust build new lives after the war. And then decades later, she again inspired new generations of people as a teacher. Let's return to her friend, Professor Dwork, to hear more about Marion. 
By the end of the war, Marion had broken nearly all of the Ten Commandments, and yet she was a saint. She was a modern day saint. She had put her life at risk in order to save others. So I would say it to her, I would say it to the students, and Marion demurred. She did not appreciate being called a saint. And when I asked her why, why was this so uncomfortable? She pointed out to the students and to me that she said, please don't make such a distinction between me and everyone. Everyone can do what I did. Susie, um, against that backdrop, what she did, uh, we have a question from a viewer named Ruth asking, what can people do today to make sure that we don't have bystanders who quietly watch as those who are persecuted suffer so much? Any thoughts on what you hope people will take away, not only from Marion, but from Hannah Senesh and their choice and her choices? Absolutely. I mean, in Marion's case, she illustrates that anyone is capable of helping others. She is the exception, not the rule, but she reminds us that if more people had been the exception, um, and heated their feelings of em empathy toward during the Holocaust, more people could have been saved. And Marion really went on, on a limb to and rose to the occasion. In Hannah Senesh's case, through her military, though her military mission was not successful, she inspired people for generations. Um, as I mentioned, her mother devoted the rest of her life to preserving Hannah's memory and in, to ensuring that people would know who Hannah was, read her writing, understand what she sacrificed for a cause that she believed in. Um, and you know, one of the important things is that the question is, what can we do? Well, you can bring, you can educate people, let them know what's going on. The Holocaust Museum on their website has um, a part of our website talks about what you can do to be um, the exception, to not be a bystander. Thank you, Susie, for that. And in fact, we were very honored this week, Secretary of State Antony Blinken came uh, to the museum to visit in person and to declare that what is happening to the Rohingya people uh, today uh, is indeed a genocide. So part is being informed and um, being in touch with your government about what you hope we would do. Susie, I wanna thank you so, so much for teaching us today and for sharing the stories of these two brave young women. It was a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you for having me. I think there's something really inspiring in the final sentiment that Professor Dwork shared about Marion Pritchard, the idea that all of us have choices, that we don't need to be an extraordinary person in order to do extraordinary things. And some of that also involves being alert to those around us who may be in need. It may not always be on our radar. Um, in Hannah's case, she was motivated by her identity as a Jewish woman and wanting to be true to her people. And for Marion, she felt compelled to protect children. So whatever it is that moves you, let's remember that we each have more agency than it may feel. Viewers, we hope that you will join us for our next program on Wednesday, April 6th, during what is Library Week here in the United States. We'll look back in history to May 1933, when members of Nazi clubs at universities across Germany burned thousands of books, including the works of Jewish authors like Sigmund Freud and those of well-known American writers like Ernest Hemingway and Helen Keller. As public campaigns to ban books resurface today, we hope you'll agree that this is a timely conversation. Until then, thank you for joining us. Be safe and be well. Bye-bye.